You might want to change the project interface uh, to use a blank one rather than this one, by the way. Okay, well. All right, looks like we're live, though. So, hey, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all who have made it now. I apologize. Um, I accidentally set the stream an hour earlier than I intended to. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. But thank you all for <clears throat> your patience. And I see we've got nine folks here. So to you, uh, to you people who could make it, I appreciate that. Uh, if you don't know what this is, this is uh, our game development stream for my channel, Infallible Code. I've got J Jason's story with me. Um, we're both a little tired today, so we're going to try to rev the engine, but we've got a, we've got some cool code to look at. We've got some cool examples. Hey, I see Tron, Carl's here. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we've got some cool examples to show you. Uh, Jason got up an hour, two hour, was it two or one hours? Or I'm not sure. But I don't even know anymore. Yeah, I, don't I don't even know. I'm so tired, right? We got up early. He got up early so he can prepare an example, so we're going to go through that. Um, Before I do that, can we, can we do just a little spot check to make sure everyone can hear me? That would be a yeah. nice uh, addition to the last stream. <laughs> yeah, we'll take some questions and stuff just to kind of get get our minds online. But uh, if you guys got any questions or if you can let us know if you can hear Jason, go ahead and talk for a little bit, Jason. Say something uh, important. An Irish. Yeah, put me on the spot, why don't you? Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be a stream. Uh, Unveil, Catagum, Dulgody, and Lefers. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> was that Gaelic or something or Irish? It is indeed. Yeah, oh, I just cool. asked, "Can I go to the bathroom?" Oh, cool. No, that, <laughs> it's that's the, English. One, one of the first sentences you learn is a, uh, <laughs> as a as an Irish student. Oh yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, let me sit. Let me say. Uh, let me respond in Spanish. I don't know if you guys knew I speak a little Spanish. Ready? No. That's <laughs> get it because no is the same in English and Spanish. Is it? Now I'm questioning myself. I know C is yes. Anyway, so it looks like uh, Jason's a little louder than Charles. I, I just nudged a little bit. Hopefully Perfect. that fixes it. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, it looks like we're good. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll do some bookkeeping here to get us all started. Again, if you got any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, if you didn't catch Sunday's video, give that a whirl. Just uh, another installment of my monthly productivity asset. Um, I don't want to call it a review, but just, I guess, my recommendation some assets that I use that kick up my productivity. Uh, this week covered Project Search and Replace, which what's funny, I haven't used it in a while, but um, I don't know if you ever used it, Jason, but I I was kind of toying around with it just to get the script going for the video. And I was like, mm. wow, this is a great asset. Like, it's very easy to use, Search and Replace. I mean, how much more difficult can you get? But um, it's, it's very robust um, in how you can search. Obviously, it's not just text search, but you can search values, components, you know, assets, prefabs, even multiple scenes uh, so it's pretty cool give it a give it a whirl if you are interested in picking it up uh, i would be remiss if i didn't say please use my affiliate link because it helps support <laughs> the channel <laughs> but i mean even if you don't it's a great asset uh, to pick up and have in your tool set <clears throat> oh starting off with a nice uh a nice comment here from lewis just wanted to uh, say you guys are doing incredible work please continue the unity community needs more content like this oh that's very nice Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. That's uh, kind of kind of our own thought process, right? Like we, we started doing this because we felt we needed, we wished we had content like this when we started. So why not add to it? What, what did they say? If you can't find it, do it yourself or something? Yeah. And we're very hard on ourselves um, in that we want to provide co uh, quality. You know, I mean, sometimes when we start these streams off and if we didn't have anything planned, we typically don't feel good about that. But, uh, mm. you know, the, we hope that we're providing content every single time we get on camera although eventually i want to i kind of do want to do a stream where we just kind of like mess around in unity maybe play some games out of the normal schedule of course it'll be some, sat course. some saturday that my wife goes out of town or i'll have some free time to just hop on the computer and mess around maybe we'll play some star trek bridge crew that's still on the list yeah, <laughs> yeah someday yeah. someday i've been playing through the the single player because i'm afraid i'm just going to be awful when i actually get into a game <laughs> as long as you can take orders I played with a friend of mine, Bob, once, and uh, he, I, I kept I, I kept waiting for the right moment, you know, giving everyone the orders, and then uh, he'd always do his job before I said it. Now, to oh, be fair, no. he has one job, he knows what to do, but it was extremely frustrating, going, I am the captain, you listen to the captain. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's a court martial. Don't take there. the initiative. Ah, oh, court martial. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, man. Can I drink and can I drink and uh and drive? I guess that's, that, that's fine. Well, it depends what role you're in. As long, yeah. as long as you're not in charge of power distribution, you're fine for for driving. I don't care. It's very little hit in space. You're okay. 
And if you're in charge of putting power to the shields, then no, you can't drink. I'm sorry. Yeah, all right, so, fair enough. Fair enough. I won't take that job. <laughs> uh, uh, it looks like Yunai is joining us from work. That's hilarious. That's awesome and hilarious. I, I hope you're working remotely. Well, you know, some people. What well, if his boss can hear him? I don't think his boss. I, yeah, I guess <laughs> not. Right. <laughs> Got a camera right behind him at his house. Yeah. <laughs> when I first started working remote. Um, <laughs> One of my managers was like, I wonder if we can get a camera, you know, in your off, your home office so we can just, you know, have you on camera at all times. And I was like, I, I hazard to ask what kind of job you're working in. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> uh, no, not, not, one, though, not one where I'd be making money on camera. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, um, it, I've, uh, I've noticed a lot of people that I talk to that I contract with have started having their employees work from home, given the. Mm -hmm. The current global crisis so i imagine there'll be a lot more people trying work from home for the first time yeah so, that's going to be very interesting. interesting and a lot of a lot of universities here in the states um, are switching to online courses uh which is pretty interesting to see and then yeah my even my wife she's working from home all this week she's done it before but um mm. it's been a while so it'll be interesting little it's surprisingly tough to do it's at first a lot, a lot of people when they first start working from home they're not familiar with kind of how to schedule yourself and uh, a little tip from somebody who's been doing it for I don't know eight ten years um, treat work still like work it can be very tempting to just sit there and sort of you know half work half game kind of jump back and forth and I don't even say this for the company's benefit I say this for your benefit mm -hmm. if you sit there and treat it like work <laughs> is also part of your day and you jump back and forth you'll keep work constantly in your mind. It's like that whole thing where you go to bed and you wake up with an idea for some code. Hmm. It's like that, but you could be sitting there watching a show or playing a game. And <clears> the fact that you're at your also work computer is going to keep your mindset on work. It, it makes a lot more sense to like dress up as if you're going to work. So put on your suit or your fancy clothes. Yeah, I was going to say. Not the house. <laughs> yeah. Make yourself your coffee and then go into your office and close the door and pretend you're not at home. Uh, and obviously, if you don't have an office, do the sitting room, isolate yourself there, treat it, but treat it like a separate room in a separate building and work on it. And then when you're done, leave and pretend you're done with work for the day. Don't merge the two. Otherwise, you'll go insane. It's just it'll, it's really not a good idea to get into the habit of treating it like it's constantly part of your day. You just have to get used to the fact that it's like a job with a very quick commute. That's the only thing that should yeah. realistically change. Yeah, it's de that's definitely there's two sides to it. There's the side of you don't want to just sit here and, you know, think, oh, I'm home, but I'm doing a little work here and there. And like, I'm going to take advantage of being home. That puts you in a mentality where you're just not you're not going to be you're going to be in between both. And it's just not it's not fun. But then there's the other one where you're like, OK, well, I'm here working and I've done this. All of a sudden you look at your clock and it's like 7 p.m. and You're still yeah. working. You should have everyone left like two hours ago, which is. You know, I would say if anything, because I found that I like that. I like to have part of my workday uh, be a time where it's not traditional nine to five. So I've actually worked it out where I will, you know, start a little bit later, a little bit earlier. And that way I, I will get some work done where no one else is in the office. No one's online. Oh, don't nice. get me wrong. I, I Since working from home, I started my day a few hours later. Like, I like the yeah. fact that I can sleep in until 10 or 11. <laughs> I used to get up and, you know, do the early commute and get in for nine. I mean, you're allowed to have some benefits from working at home, but I'm just saying once you do start your day, treat it like a work day. Yeah, absolutely. Here's another pro tip. If you if this is your first time working from home and you work for you, you have a position where you conceivably could do it from home, you know, you could take advantage of the situation and maybe position yourself to where you could just work from home going forward now. But mm -hmm. in order to do that, you need to over communicate. I mean, that to me if you if you have a manager that you check in with or a team that you you have to collaborate with, over communicate. If you're on Slack or Skype or Discord, constantly check in at first. You know, make sure you're always answering your emails. Don't let a perception build that you're not at your desk. Because even if you are and you miss a message, which is funny because uh, well, I know Jason's probably like rolling his eyes because I'm I flake out on him on Discord all the time, but. <laughs> If I was working with him, I would make sure that I'd be like looking at his Discord like a hawk, you know, and I'd be like always responding because you don't want to. It's very easy to have that perception build that oh, this guy's at home, you know, what is he doing? He's not. He's probably not working. But if you're always communicating and you're always demonstrating that you're working, you know, you're gonna make sure that you cultivate a, a, a positive perception because it's very it's easy. Same goes with if you are going after something like yeah. The, one of the beauties about working from home is that you can do middle of the day stuff that you can't normally do with 
a nine to five job. So a lot of yeah. shops, obviously you're dealing with the hours the shop is open. And if you have, if you work from home, you have the benefit to go, you know what, I'm going to go have a coffee at one o'clock or, or whatever and go out for a while, or maybe at three o'clock I'll go out and, you know, get some stuff done in town. But if you do that, make a point of sending a message to your team first and say, I'm going to be out for an hour or two. That way you don't suddenly get two or three missed calls when you come back and they think, has he just not been at work all day? <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it makes, a, it makes a, a good impression to kind of keep that, keep that conversation going, you know? Yeah. And just to bring it back to game dev, you know, I think working from home is good practice. Because, you know, I think, especially speaking from experience, when I first really got into game dev and I was like, you know, I was in, under the mentality that, oh, I'm a hobbyist game developer. I'd have all these these ideas bouncing around in my head of things I wanted to create and implement. And then you sit down to your computer and then you just kind of treat it like, I don't know, for me, it'd be like a Saturday and I'd have a couple hours to just sit at the yeah, computer. Yeah, you're, you're doodling. You're exactly just doodling. Same, yeah, yeah, you're just treating it like, oh, you know, you got a YouTube video open and you're like, well, let me research this thing. And you're like, all of a sudden you're like, two hours in and you've been messing around on YouTube and in some documentation, you haven't done anything Hundred yeah. percent. when you're, and when you're working, you're like, I have to get this done at all costs, you know, mm -hmm. cost, but you know, you have a deadline, you got things to do. I, I've said this before, <laughs> but I think one of the, one of the biggest changes to the way I approach work in any context hmm. has been since I started to treat myself as an employee mm -hmm. of myself. So if yep. you, if you just look at your, I feel seen, sorry. So <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> If you just look at your life in such a way where you, any task you want done, if you're making your own game, if you're trying to do the laundry, it doesn't matter what it is you're doing. Yeah. But if you think about it as how much would I pay someone to do this job? And all the time you spend on it is time you are effectively paying yourself at rate. Because if you're not doing it, hypothetically, you could be doing other work and being paid for it. And if you have that mindset, you start to realize, my God, I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> because I spend so like I'll sit down with the intention of building a health system and I'll be messing about on Reddit and, you know, watching YouTube videos and all of a sudden six hours go by and it's like, hang on a second. If I was paying myself my own hourly rate, I would fire myself for the amount of time I just wasted in an attempt <laughs> to build a system. And so it sounds silly, but realistically, ask yourself how much you would like to be paid to do that job that you've given yourself to do. And if you keep that in mind, you will sit down, write something down with a note. I will do this thing, do it. Then you can stop Then you can play whatever the hell you like. And that's fine because you can start to see your time as valuable as an employee. And I really do think if you can really internalize that mindset, most work will be a lot easier. You start to realize that every task or job is an assignment you give yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it just, at the end of the day, it's for your own benefit because like even the laundry or the dishes, mm -hmm. it, it's like those menial tasks. If you just focus in, you'll get them done. You know, and then and then you won't have to do them anymore. Yep. I mean, you will probably a couple of days later, which is the worst thing about chores. But <laughs> you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> or, oh yeah, don't. As much as I love for you all to spend your entire day watching my videos, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, get work done. But get you know, watch, watch some in between as, on your lunch breaks. Yeah. Oh man, uh, <clears throat> Mikhail is in uh, Venice. There, hey, anyone who's uh, in a hot hot zone for mm. the virus, be safe, be safe out there. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, it's interesting. I've seen a lot of companies mentioning this, like, you know, almost kind of like they'll say, Hey, uh, you, use use your time in quarantine wisely, try to get stuff done, but that'll also be like a way to like promote their own product. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there've been, I've seen like so many apology newsletters, like we're sorry about being insensitive, but look, if you're going to be quarantined, you know, um, might as well use the time and try to get some stuff done. If you got a game idea that you've been mulling around, uh, you know, and if you just got some cycles, you know, take the opportunity to practice treating yourself like an employee of your own company, mm. of your own game studio. Yeah, because that's another thing, too, that's a common misconception. <laughs> Anybody who works a very long nine to five job who has a dream to make their own game or, or build their own project or something, you'll, you'll constantly have this in your head circling going, if I wasn't so busy with work, if I had more free <laughs> time, I would get all of these things done. Then you go home at, at the evenings and oh, I'm too tired. I just spent the whole day working. I'm not going to get anything done on my project. Or you might get an hour or two done, but you don't get as much as you'd like. Yeah. And you keep telling yourself, I had a whole day. I could get so much done. And then the weekends come and you're like, oh, but I've been working all week. So I just want to relax. I don't yeah. want to work all week. So you start playing around and you have some fun. And then you basically repeat that cycle. And so you just keep telling yourself, the day that I have two or three days free, I'll get work done. But every time you do, your then mindset is, oh, well, it's a holiday now. I can take a break. So realistically 
I've, I've noticed I get more work done when I'm busy on side projects than I do when I've got lots of free time because lots of free time ends up giving you this mindset of, well, I've got lots of free time. And, and what I forgot who said it, but a project's timeline will expand to fill the time allotted. And it's, it's one of those, the, the internet laws, and it's 100% true. If I give you a week to do <laughs> yeah, something, yeah. it'll take a week to do it. If I give you a month to do something, it'll take a month to do it because 100%. you'll take your time with it. <laughs> so realistically, still treat your projects like serious <laughs> projects and don't just assume that when you have more free time, you'll get more done. You still have to pretend you're working on a tight schedule for a boss. Otherwise, you just won't do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and Rah Rahataj, I'm sorry if I miss pronounce that had a good point there i found that it's easier to work from home if you have someone to show your work to find someone mm -hmm. who's, yeah so basically that and that's what it is when you're working remotely like i have tasks that i need to do i work for a company of my nine to five you could say and if i don't if i don't deliver anything if there's no deliverables then they're gonna they're gonna fire my ass you know that's just what is gonna happen so the same thing happens with uh you know your your game development on the side you have this dream to make a game it if you have nothing to deliver so to speak on a regular basis, you know, if you have no deadlines set for yourself, you're just asking to eventually just, you know, burn out and never finish your project. Mm -hmm. So the advice would be work in iterations, try to provide MVPs, which are, um, Minimum uh, viable min product. Minimum viable, I almost said most valuable player. I might put a second about tire. Yeah, minimum viable, minimum viable products. So what would that look like? Well, let's say you have this idea to make you know, re make your own Skyrim. I don't know. I always go to Skyrim because that's the game I play the most. But um, so you're like, okay, you want to make, oh, that's a big game to make, Skyrim. So at least say, well, as a first step, I'm just going to get movement working and I'm going to get the, uh, I'm going to get the functionality of being able to switch from first person to third person. Make that your entire goal for a month or you know, whatever and make that be your deliverable. And then, you know, maybe share that goal with other people. Um, because if you could get into this sort of rhythm of, coming up with a feature, implementing it, and then giving it to a, a couple of folks to test it out, you know, as their, mm -hmm. as your, as your test group, uh, test users, if you can get into like a rhythm of doing that, it's just a sort of accountability that's going to help you stick to your project and, and avoid that burnout. Cause eventually on any product, bigger, uh, any project, big or small, you're going to get to some task that you're just, you're just not going to want to do. Um, you know, so usually it's like deployment related tasks I've seen, like having to bundle up the package and fill out all the metadata like there's going to be things like that or like maybe i remember one time i was working on a mobile game and i had all the functionality of the game completed it was a very very simple game and then i got to the point where i was like okay i want to implement a leaderboard for this game because you know i wanted to be able to have everyone to share their score and i got to that and i started looking up some libraries and i was just like wow this is so boring like this is the most boring <laughs> thing i've ever had to implement and then honestly i just stopped working on the project Actually, it's really sad for me to think about that now because I really had a lot of that game done. <laughs> but it was like a, one of those things I, was, I would work on on the weekends. And it just got. And, and I have the, the opposite problem too, which is oftentimes you'll hit, you'll start working on a project and getting good work done towards features you want. And you'll hit an area that's just slightly more fun than everything else. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you, you're building some, let's, let's say, example, the same one, a high score for it, and you want to design how it visually looks. And you might end up enjoying spending five hours, what I call pixel pushing. So you're just nudging images slightly left and slightly right and <laughs> oh, I love that. hinting in a different color. And you're like, you blink and you've lost seven hours. And so <laughs> I, I know I'm prone to that. So what I tend to do is I force myself to make my first iteration of every single UI console based. Mm -hmm. I know that may sound weird, but basically what I do is um, if something has a visual component where it reads out what the current objects are selected or whatever, uh, without going into it, because it might be another video, is the whole humble dialogue pattern. Mm. I would use that, and I would print the answers to the console. So I would have a shop front or a high score, and it would just print it to the console. And if that prints successfully, the UI technically works. It's not visually there, but it works. And I can get back working on the things that matter. And then when I have free time, I can come back and play with the design. But it means I can verify that the feature works without sort of saying, oh, well, I need it to visually display before I add all the features. It's like, no, you don't. You can add the features, make it print to console, get back to work on the real stuff that matters. And then when your time is free, come back and sort of jazz up the UI. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, there's so many tips like that. And it, what's interesting is I almost feel like <clears throat> you just have to experience a lot of these, a lot of these things. 
like the, the pixel pushing thing you mentioned, mm. you can tell someone that, oh, you know, don't get don't get lost to, you know, messing around with something so finite and whatever for so long. But until you really experience it and you see it and you realize what you, you're, you're doing, it's really hard to like get that across. I've done that so many times. More recently, I did was messing around with the um, Unity lighting, mm. um, and I was just oh my gosh because it takes like, I mean my GPU is pretty good, so it take maybe like two or three minutes to bake the lighting of a scene. And I like I bake the lighting. I'm like okay, let me turn up the the light map resolution. Bake the lighting. You know, like yeah, put on a yeah. YouTube video. All right, let me try this out. And it's like it's so it's so there's no value in it. There's really no value in it. Yeah, and there's also that there's two sneaky things about that. One is people don't realize that if you're working on something that has compile time or build time, like lighting, mm -hmm. that may cost you whatever that cycle is. It might cost you a minute or two of build. What everyone does, like provably, everybody does this. When you've got a minute or two free like that, you will open up something else. You 100%. will open up Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or whatever, and you will spend approximately two times the build time. Mm -hmm. You'll roughly spend four minutes or six minutes or whatever. And so everything that should take a minute or two, which is already wasting your time, gets multiplied by the fact that you're now wasting your time doing other things. And then God forbid you get sucked into that by reading an article that's, that's going to take you 15 minutes when you meant to only spend a minute or two while waiting. Yeah. So try to avoid tasks which have build cycles, or if they do, try to minimize the build cycle so that you don't give yourself enough time to distract yourself with third party things. It's true, man. Oof, it's hard. It's, it it isn't easy, uh, you know. Yeah. Doing this. And there's one other comment too that I, I highly relate to <laughs> is uh, asset creation and animation is my main source of burnout. Mm. Everything you make is not good enough when you wake up the next day. That <laughs> is a hundred percent an infinite cycle that uh, I have the same problem with, which <laughs> is uh, because again I'm a programmer. I don't really do art or animation stuff. I do it when I need to, but I don't lean into it. Um, it's never good enough to my standards because I. I work with artists, so I see things in projects I work on of really high quality, and it's very frustrating when I can't achieve that myself. So I end up wasting a lot of time repeating things and, and kind of plumossing it and, and like nudging it to make it better. But the fact of the matter is, my skill set is in writing the code that makes it run, not doing the animation. So to come back to this question of would you pay yourself to do this job, the answer is no. If I was a hired contracted artist and I saw the work I produce as an artist, I wouldn't pay myself for that. So what I do is I, I keep this interface concept, right? I draw a boundary line and I build the code that fires the triggers and events into an animator. And then I make the <clears throat> jankiest thing I can to just basically work. And I tell myself, this isn't even meant to pretend to be a real implementation. And that way I can detach from my brain the idea yeah. that I have to make it look good enough. I can just say it is a joke. It is a horrible demonstration of the code working and nothing else. And I can then continue focusing on the code stuff and if the time comes, I can either hire somebody, ask a friend of mine, or if I do have to do it myself, I will turn that into a project. I will now, having gotten all of the code done, because I, I took the time to focus on that first, I can then go in and start really spending time, you know, poking the animations and stuff with an intent to fixing it, not do it in between the code and distract from what I'm supposed to be doing. So I always treat that as a make it throw away, then go in and treat it like another layer on top that you're changing afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it kind of harkens back to something we've spoken about before, which is you know if you really do have this goal of making a game, you have a vision, you know you you have some sort of game mechanic and story, whatever the case may be, you have to treat yourself as if you are running a company, you know, and that means that you know as you build out this project, this game, you're gonna want to have it sort of plug and play, meaning you know the animation you have here, it's a, it's ugly because you made it or whatever, but someone else can come through you can hire an artist <clears throat> you know the music maybe maybe uh you, you don't have any real soundtracks maybe you just have a bunch mm -hmm. of silly sound effects that you found on the internet or whatever but it's filling the void that you will eventually uh fill in uh, or it uh it has there's an empty void there that you're going to fill in with someone that you uh hire to 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 put actual music in um, and that goes for all the other things too like graphics and, and also and i can't stress enough right you may be an indie dev thinking you know, I can't, I, I can't pay people to do this. They cost a fortune. I'm not going to pay an artist 200 for concept art. <laughs> and I mean, I understand that instinct. And unless you're literally broke and can't afford it, realistically, most people can afford it. They just think it's way too much money for what, what constitutes a small test project or something. <clears throat> but realistically, right? 
if you are dedicating weeks and months of your life to a project, you're going to have to invest some money in it mm -hmm. because you're effectively already investing your potential day rate at the number of hours you're putting in. You are investing that money. And if you're not willing to go that extra nudge, put a bit of money in to make the art side as good as the effort you're putting in, it'll feel like wasted effort. You'll have put in basically three, 4,000 of your hours worth of time and you won't pay somebody for two or three of their hours to kind of shore up a side of it, which is audio or art. Um, it's, it really feels like a waste because you end up with a project which has all the code you need, mm. but genuinely won't make it very far because it doesn't look particularly appealing. And the unfortunate truth is a lot of projects do come down to how visually appealing they are. We're not saying you have to go and make a AAA art project, but there is a certain level of sort of, for example, feel free to buy a lot of assets on the asset store, but they're all going to have different textures by different texture artists with different themes and different color palettes and whatever. Yeah. If you just hire someone to take all of the assets you've bought on the store, take the textures from them and use Photoshop and just basically make them consistent, yeah. similar art style, similar colors. That will cost you a couple hundred minimum, possibly up to a few thousand, depending on the size of your project. But doing that turns your project from a mishmash of unity assets to a cohesive art style. And that tiny amount is enough to drastically make your project look like a professional project. And honestly, like it's, it's not, it, it, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't invest enough money to make your project look as good as you want it to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly valuable uh, thought because yeah, I think a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of indie game developers have a grand vision and you just have to, you have to see it through. And the way you do that is you really do have to pull in other you know, other, other people into it. And, and, uh, that's how you'll get it done. I mean, that's just the, the reality of it. I mean, Ooh. granted you could make flappy bird and you know, then you, that's a little bit easier, but typically from what I've heard of game developers and their visions, it's most of the time it's like, yeah, you're probably going to need some help on that, mm -hmm. which is okay. You, you know, that's part of it. It's like anything. I mean, even if you're music, like a musician and, and you want to be a, uh, you know, an indie musician and an artist, you're going to have to pull in band members and, people to produce things for you and you're gonna have to get time at a, at a recording studio. You mm -hmm. know, there, every, everything that, uh, every dream out there is, has a little bit of capital behind it. So it's important to set up your project in a way that you'll be able to actually leverage, you know, other, other people, other talent to help you be successful. Yeah, and, and like I said, like there is a difference between doing a project for learning, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And I make a point of saying this, I, I will attempt every job I would hire someone to do at least once. So I have done some animation, some 3D modeling, some concept art, some level design, some audio engineering. Mm -hmm. I am bad at most of those things, <laughs> but I could functionally make audio and I could functionally make 3D models. But for me, it's a cost benefit analysis. It would take mm -hmm. me six to 10 times longer to produce something of half the quality than I would get by paying someone to do the same job. So, yeah. it, but the difference is having done the job, I now know what the job entails and how much work I'm asking for. And that's very valuable when you start trying to figure out, hang on a second, this person wants 2000 for a really high quality model for my main character. That's <laughs> insane money. And you're like, well, actually that's going to take them a month to do what, how much would I want for a month of work on that? And then you, once you start doing the math, you realize, oh, okay, that is how much it costs. That is a <laughs> job. You are paying for the modeling and the texturing and the rigging and all the other parts that are involved. And the experience that, that they have. Yeah which is, you know, insane. It, especially if you think of as a software developer, I, you know, I think of some, how I've been lowballed before in the past and it's like, okay, maybe the thing that I'm developing for you is very minimal, but you're paying half of what you're paying is for my experience, you know, mm -hmm. to do it in a way that is correct and robust and, you know, scalable. But, uh, but yeah, you, you gotta think about that. Was that was one of the hardest things I had as a personal experience <laughs> moving into contracting and consulting work was especially with consulting. It's very hard to mentally reconcile the fact that you're being paid for a few hours conversation, more money than you would have done by developing for nine hours. <laughs> and it's like, do I feel like this is insane to me that people are paying me this much money, but it's not until you take a step back and realize the things I'm talking about, the architecture I'm suggesting that we put in place is literally going to save hundreds of hours of rewrites and refactorings and dealing with bugs and, you know, so many other issues that I've learned how to resolve and how to step around that if they pay me two salaries for worth of work to avoid 
maybe four people's worth of work in future or a month's worth of work for paying me for two hours at double rate or something. It really is a benefit. <laughs> and it's it, once, once you start to really see this, and I've seen this in a few projects I've worked on recently, where the changes that I've put in place have fundamentally half development time mm. on new features. And once I start to see this, I'm like, okay, now I can kind of justify my own rates, which is sort of a weird thing to say. So again, yeah, you're paying for experience. When you're hiring somebody, you're paying for not just what they can do, but all of the time they have spent learning their craft. And you'd be surprised how much that is. Like you, you take for granted that whatever you've been doing, you spend all of your time doing it, but everybody else has their thing that they're doing and they probably did the same amount of time. So if you hire that artist and you think, oh, they're just drawing some stuff. It's like, yeah, but they're also, they've probably spent 20,000 hours or so, you know, starting with circles, moving their way up through <laughs> everything else that you would have done in the similar field that you're in. So yeah, I, I've, I've really learned not to lowball people on their skill sets. And it also lets you evaluate whether or not someone's worth hiring. Whether that's, what, that's why on a whole different tangent, when you apply for a job, People think their CV is the most important part, but it's not. In most jobs, it's going to be either your portfolio mm -hmm. or it's going to be literally the in-person interview. And the reason oh, yeah. why is the same thing. It comes down to, is the person you're talking to passionate about the job they're doing? If they're, well, no matter what it is, if they, if they enjoy programming or they enjoy art or they enjoy sound design, you will hear it. They will, they will talk passionately about it. They will talk about all of these cool articles they read recently that talk about new techniques. That's the person you want to hire because you're getting free uh, work from them because every moment they're not with you, they're off training themselves more. Yeah. And you're paying, you're, you're getting that for free because you're getting someone who's basically upskilling constantly while working with you because they enjoy <laughs> doing it. Yeah. If you hire somebody who's got a really good track record of skills, but fundamentally doesn't like their job, they're going to put in the bare minimum. Yeah. Not because they're trying to screw you, but just because they don't like it enough to do it as a hobby as well. Yeah. And so they're going to be capped at how much knowledge they have because they just simply won't want to do it in their free time. So that's why a portfolio or a GitHub profile or whatever is ranked by um, a lot of people as one of the most important things for a dev to have because it shows they enjoy doing it and they work on it whenever they can. And similarly with an art profile. And then in an interview, it's can you see that passion that a person has for the topic they're talking about? That, so. that plays really well into a question that we just got and also something that I'm dealing with right now. Uh, some creepy dude, that's hilarious, says, how do you know if you are skilled enough in terms of code patterns and structure to work in game development professionally? Uh, and there were some good answers there in the chat too. Basically, it's, it's what Jason said. There, is, there really is no point. I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to provide some level of value to an organization, to a, a game dev studio. Now, if someone has more experience and more skill, so to speak, than you, it doesn't mean that you know he, that person should be hired over you or whatever the case may be. You're, each of you are going to provide some level of value to that game stu development studio. But what I think what's more important isn't necessarily your skill set at any given point in time, but it's the rate at which you're leveling up. Yeah, and um, how much you're willing to acquire new information. That's 100%. I've yeah. taken jobs where I didn't know how to do them. Yeah. And I spent the first week of the job learning how to do the thing that I've just been hired to do. And I used to say that. Oh, Jason, I think you froze real quick. It's, 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 oh, my back. Oh, uh, yeah. Say that again. I used to say this. Sorry to that. Yeah. So I, I used to say to people who try to hire me, like, I don't know this. Don't hire me. Hire somebody who knows what they're doing. And it wasn't <laughs> until a friend of mine turned to me and said, look, I've worked with you before. You enjoy what you're doing you've picked up things more complicated than this in shorter periods of time, you'll figure it out. And if you don't, fine, we've lost a week, so what? Mm -hmm. And when I kind of realized that, and I took on this project and I did a load of stuff that uh, by the end of it that I'd never done before, it really changed my perspective. Now it's a case of, I don't really care if I have the experience to take a job. I ask myself, do I honestly believe if I just immerse myself in it for a week, could I learn it? And the answer is usually yes, right? Because there's yeah. loads of guides online. We've all We've all looked at a new technology for the first time and went, oh, this is scary. And then after four or five days, went, oh, look, I've got a demo up and running. And then another few days, you've added some custom stuff to it. And then by two weeks, you're comfortable enough to talk about it as a feature that you know how to do. So as long as you can do that, then you're almost always qualified. If you can, if you can talk your way into a job mm -hmm. where you, you can interview well, you look passionate, the person hiring, if they're smart, will say, I have faith. I can give this person a job they've never done before leave them alone for two weeks and they'll come back and tell me how it works because they will have gone and learned how to do it. And that's what I look for when I hire people. And I think 
I wouldn't worry about have to having an entire history of experience. Worry about being willing to and being able to pick up knowledge quickly. We just hired someone in my company, um, and we hired him. He's still in. He's still at university. He's about to graduate in December. He doesn't have very much work experience, but he's demonstrated in his school projects that he is competent. Um, he has a GitHub account, and uh, he actually actually has a YouTube channel where he like he go on he go go on and show that he's working on like the Android TV API things like that. Um, and even though he doesn't have the experience, we can see that he's willing to learn. He demonstrates that he wants to learn and he actively is learning in his free time. On top of that, when we spoke to him during the interview, one of the things we asked was, Hey, look, we're thinking about exploring the, uh, we're thinking about switching from being Java based in our organization to moving to some C sharp .net stuff. Are you, are you comfortable with that? And he was like, Oh yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll learn anything like what one framework, one language, you know, is just like any other. I'll just read about it, learn it, and I'll, I'm happy to 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 use it if that's what you want to do. And to me, I was like, all right, there you go. I mean, say no more. I mean, that demonstration is enough because every I think every developer should have that mentality that look, it's you shouldn't be hung up on one technology over the other. If you have a goal, let's say your goal is to make a game or your goal is to implement some feature, you should it you should use the best technology that's available to get you there. And maybe sometimes the the best isn't like the most optimal or the most efficient. Maybe it's the one that uh, everyone on your team is most familiar with and that'll help you rapidly get to that goal. Or maybe it's the one that has the most community support and that'll mm -hmm. help you solve the particular edge cases that your feature might have over, you know, some other framework that, you know, is maybe more generic and wouldn't be able to handle those special things. But yeah, like, like don't get me wrong. C Sharp, um, well, the dot, dot .NET in general is, is my favorite platform yes, c sharp is my favorite language and i will do everything in my power to get to work in the things that i am <laughs> most proficient at but when i build websites i use mean stack because asp.net is just woefully less um it's, it's much just harder to work with it's slower there's lots of issues with why it's just not the ideal stack for dealing with web stuff these days yeah it's just it's just you want to be using node and you want to be using something like react it's just the way the world works these days not, not saying you can't use React with ASP.NET, but I don't, I don't want to get into a whole big thing. All yeah. I'm saying is I will use the tools that I'm, I prefer less if they're better for the job. So I, like, I don't advertise I'm a JavaScript developer because I don't want someone to hire me as a JavaScript developer because <laughs> I don't want to work in JavaScript. But if a job comes up and it needs it, I can do it. It's just I will advertise for jobs that I would prefer to do. Mm. So like, I guess, yeah, it's just to repeat what Charles was saying is that you you use the tools that you need for the task you're doing. But as long as you're willing to learn, I, I think as, as has been said in the chat as well, if you're willing to learn, you're already probably skilled enough for the job. <laughs> so yeah. Basically is. yeah. Learning is a skill that's required. I think in our field, uh, are the ability or the willingness and ability to learn your ability to take in information and leverage it. Um, that is a skill. And I think that people don't think of it, of it as a skill, but mm -hmm. you know, I could I could get someone, I could hire someone who just has twenty years of experience in Java, and they're the best Java person in the world because they have seen everything that you could throw at them. But they're not very skilled at pulling in new information. They they don't really like to learn, and they don't like to break away from what they already know. That person is going to be way less valued and valuable to my organization because all they can provide is 20 years worth of Java experience. But obviously, things are moving in different directions, and I might need to leverage Node or maybe mm -hmm. Python or something like that. Maybe I'm trying to take my data and, and perform some analytics on it. Java is not going to be able to do that as efficiently as something like Python um, or F Sharp or whatever those languages are. There, there are different things. That's why it's more valuable to say, hey, look, I, I'm willing to learn, and uh, it doesn't matter what you throw at me. I'm going to do my best to, to leverage it. That's definitely way more valuable than 20 years worth of Java experience. So I think we've uh, answered the question. Yeah, <laughs> and then maybe. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe even more than that. <laughs> well, I don't know. What do you think? You want to dive into some code? Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, enough rambling. Maybe we can try to give some practical examples. <laughs> Well, we spoke a lot about, you know, kind of setting your project up in a way where you could fill in the blanks by hiring other individuals to mm -hmm. come in. So I think uh, our today's topic is a good example of of how to get there. 
Um, so I, I don't know if you want me to pull up some, pull up the code, switch over to the editor. How do you want to? Did you have a, a vision? For um, this? I was kind of thinking we'd start with an empty project rather than confuse people, and we'll just sort of like we'll we'll muse about ideas and and work our way through the love ideas. It. I, I love it. All right, so I'm gonna switch on over. You're gonna see my beautiful desktop here. I'm gonna close this project. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna start with a blank project. So today we're we're gonna take a look at um, some interfaces, talk about contracts, uh, which is you know a way in programming. Let's see, what do we call this? Live stream. Well, let's get creative. Live stream. Uh, what's today's date? <laughs> twenty twenty. Uh, it's March something, right? O three. Sixteenth. Sixteenth, twenty twenty. All right, create that project. Yeah, so we're going to talk about interfaces, defining contracts, um, and how that is very valuable, very valuable programming concept in uh, making your project maintainable, scalable, and flexible. So I've, I've been trying to find a good way to discuss this topic because it's kind of a confusing one, especially if you come from um, more of a Unity background. Interfaces are not something you're going to need a lot of, at least mm -hmm. basically natively through the normal architecture. Because without getting too much into it, the, a lot of the benefits of interfaces are abstractions, and the component model kind of gives you that automatically. So a lot of people kind of fall into an abstraction layer without realizing it. But here we're going to be a bit more pragmatic and hands-on. So I'm going to start with saying that what, one of the common questions I'll get asked is, what's the difference between um, abstract classes and interfaces? Um, apparently, my webcam is is... Yeah, incorrectly aligned, Charles. Oh, it sure is. My bad. Thank you. Um, Thank you for pointing that out. So, yeah. So one of the, the, where was I? Yes, abstract classes and interfaces. So a common question that get asked is, what's the difference between abstract classes and interfaces? Now, we're going to demonstrate, hopefully, exactly that pretty much now. Um, but the first thing I will say is that from a technical level, they're basically the same thing, except for the fact that abstract classes have implementation. But there's actually a much bigger and more important difference which is use case. And I think that's something we'll hopefully demonstrate well here, which is you use an abstract class to represent a base component of an object. So you might create an abstract concept called an animal and dog and cat might inherit from it. But the difference is interfaces represent encapsulation of a promised behavior. And we'll see more of that when we start getting into it. But the, the metaphor I've been using is that an interface is like a uh, your CV, right? When you're applying for a job to keep the theme relevant to what we were saying earlier. If you're applying for a job, you list the skills you have. I can do C Sharp. I can work in Unity. I know how to animate in Unity. These are promises you're making. And the difference is, unlike Animal, which is a base abstract class for a series of um, objects, an interface could be, I can eat food. I can mm -hmm. make noise. I can run. These are not a single base behavior. These are a promised set of behaviors that you could say you do. They're kind of, again, your, your CV or your list of, these are things I am capable of doing. And hopefully we'll, we'll do more practical now. So yeah. at least I'm hoping that at least gets a, a rough example of what I'm talking about. We'll try to be more hands-on now. So I guess uh, movement might be a good starting point. What yeah, do you think? I think that's a good one. That's, a, that's one everyone can understand. I can move. I can move, sure. <laughs> I like that. How funny that that worked out. That because like the whole I, um, prepending an interface with with the letter I, that's just a convention. I yeah. don't know if you know, I think a lot of people. Well, I don't say a lot of people, but I'm, I think some, at least some people don't really realize that you mm -hmm. don't have to pre prepend with an interface with I. Um, yeah. So like you might you might have seen interfaces like I movable where you we're calling it I can movement because I can move because that's something that's a little easier. So linguistically clear. I yeah, guess, yeah. linguist. Yeah, in this in this context where we're trying to educate here during this stream, but typically we would probably call that I movable. You know, there are things like you know I changeable, I interactable is a popular one. Two things: the I is just a convention that sig that. Um, uh, telegraphs to other programmers without even having to open up the file, uh, the class file that they know, oh, this isn't probably an interface. You can make a pretty solid bet that that's an interface. Um, but we're just going to call it I can move because just like Jason said, we're describing 
the CV, the contract of this particular interface and objects who implement this interface, they're just saying, hey, look, I can move. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. We're going to find that out. So I'll right. make this an interface. Well, what are you doing? Oh, I'm an idiot. Sorry. <laughs> Can you guys believe that? <laughs> Jason's okay, like, no, go. you look like a fool. <laughs> uh, right. So let, let's just start simply and just go move up, down, left, right. All right. Guess. So up. Yeah. Want to describe what we're doing? What is this? So this is this is us kind of plumbing the contract. So this is us saying these are the promised behaviors, the things that say they can move. So that's like if you say a. Hey, on my CV is the ability to move. You're like, oh yeah, well, move up, move down, move left, move right. Okay, cool. You conform to the ability to be able to move. You promised you can, you now must implement these features. Yeah. And that's why if you make an object that, that has an implementation of this interface, you will be forced to provide these behaviors because you are making the promise that you can do this. So uh, let's- I, I let kind of want to make it, before we even implement this, I think it'd be interesting to show like a class that just uses it, you know, just so that you don't even have to make an implementation. That's a good idea. You know we'll, need to do, we'll need to do that anyway. Um, so yeah. Like that, mover that's... or something, move control, mover, I don't know, object mover. Sure. So let me, let's say we have um, a mono behavior that's going to just move a whole bunch of objects. Or let's just, for now, we'll just say one. We'll, we'll just stick with one. Yeah, let's, let's yeah. keep it simple. <laughs> I don't know if you want to just do it like this, you know, just whatever. Um, I, I usually would um, take a game object and then grab okay. the interface from it, but whichever. Fair enough. Let's do that just to keep it sort of like within the realm of how you might do something in Unity. Let's call this a movable object, right? So we can set that from the editor and then um, let's say we'll be, we'll be inefficient here. Um, and we'll use some pseudocode, I think. So we'll have a, a update method. And then let's just say we'll have a variable is moving up, right? And then basically we'll have some a comment that says, you know, we're getting this from something, right? Let's say we have some class. We're retrieving this. Oh my god, I can't spell from some class. We'll, we'll figure out how that happens later. But right now we'll have is moving up. Then what you can do is we're gonna get our I can move. Now I'm I'm not following any sort of convention, so we're gonna change all of this. I'm sure Jason's like, dude, we gotta change all of this. But just to just to get the <laughs> idea, we're gonna get a component. Or rather we, we, we can get the opponent in a wake. Let's let's keep some some standards in place. Otherwise people would start chatting at us in the chat. All right, guy me, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say in, in a wake, let's right. just grab let's... a yeah. So now make a private uh a version of the uh I can move, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hate calling it I can move, but I know we're just following our convention here. Well, well, well that's why, uh, again, I was going to go object with that interface and we drag in the object because I think, I think the thing is, I think this is going to lead to more confusion. Fair enough. All right. Fair enough. So like if we just make something called cube or, or like mover or character, just call it character. All right. Character. That's I, 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 I want to kind of lead into a more kind of simpler approach to this just for, for explaining the concept. I think, I think you're absolutely right. So then we'll have. It'll be a mono behavior as well. It'll behave mono behavior, and it'll take it. It'll be also I can move because now it narratively states a character can move, right? That's fair. That's fair. All right. So now we're now we're gonna have to implement this. This is why it's complaining. It's saying, "Hey, look, you you're going to implement I can move, but you have not implemented this contract. You promised that you would. So by simply adding these methods up, down, left, right, now we're saying, okay, we promised that we would implement it. Um, granted, it right now we're throwing. I'll just get rid of those. We have the method calls, so these are there. So any anyone who references this character uh, object, we know that it's implementing I can move, which is saying that it promises it has some methods that represent up, down, left, and right. And so we just plumb a basic implementation by just taking its position and adding vector three <clears throat> up, down, left, right. Well, I up, down, forward, back, because it's you probably want to be forward, not up. Yeah. Yeah. So back. Um, Sorry, I know you guys are probably hearing this like chime from my windows. Um, I can't hear anything. You're fine. They're they're probably hearing. It. I remember they mentioned it last time, and every time I hear it, I'm like, oh god, it's so <laughs> annoying. I apologize. I'll try not to make any mistakes, <laughs> so as to not make windows chime at chime at us. But there's our basic implementation. Cool. Let's zoom out. So, so you were right. This this will make it much easier to show this part. <laughs> Yeah, because then we just use character, right? We can just have a character object, and it doesn't matter the fact that it's specifically an interface. We, we don't have just... to do anything fancy with it. 
So well, you can replace the object with just character, the, the one movable. Yes, yes, yes. Oops, sorry. Gotcha. Character. All right. All right. So now we yeah, and, and just character. just for people in the chat, we are staying away from serialized reference in this video. That's a whole different topic, and I don't want to get into the kind of nuances of how you use interfaces with Unity. We're just yeah. trying to cover what an interface is and how it works for now, at least. Um, we can delete the awake function. We're not going to need that. Yeah, yeah. Let's start um, fresh. Let's start fresh. Yeah. So I, I I like to just do a straightforward. Um, so before we do that, so, so I don't I don't want to focus on the input. So let's just do an input thing really quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you go after forty one. Mm -hmm. And just make a method uh, bool key pressed. Okay. And just take in a key code. And just yeah, return input that get key down. And then we can just make some accessors uh, for press left, press right, press up, press down, and then uh, defer to that function. I don't want to focus too much on this. This is just to kind of give us the plumbing to get to where we need to be. Yeah. Uh, left arrow. Dealer's choice, whatever whatever controls you'd like. <laughs> I'll use the arrow keys because I'm a psychopath. <laughs> and just this is, as a small note, this is a kind of a general pattern I use for anyone who's curious. Um, you create a function that encapsulates the basic behavior you want, and then you'd create accessors that give you access to the ones that you need for it. Without spoiling anything, we'll probably move this into its own interface later, but that's not relevant right now. <laughs> um, All right. Cool. So now we can do an update uh, update movement function and then call it an update and then defer to each one of those. So if pressed up, we'll start with up and we'll say character dot up. Uh, else if pressed down. So the reason um, the reason why we're not referencing just the interface instead of the character at the moment is because we have no reason to downgrade the features. We are currently moving a character. So arbitrarily limiting us to not having properties of a character feels good because it feels like you're moving to the most abstract version. But honestly, that's not the point of interfaces. That's a common mistake people make where they automatically downgrade everything to the lowest encapsulation. But they're going to find later on in their code you're going to have to cast back up again at some point to get access to features. So as a general rule, I recommend not casting everything to its lowest interface until you have to. The point of an interface is not to remove features, it's the ability to add features and to make things more compatible. Yeah. There's zero reason to just arbitrarily bake this down to the lowest interface type. There's no benefit to it. Yeah, like in this case, we might say, uh, yeah, we're never going to change the way this works. It's always going to be up, down, left, right in the with the arrow keys, and there's no need for us to provide any different implementation. Maybe this is just going to live as a, brow a web browser, like little applet or game. We're not going to port mm. this to like Xbox or something. Um, so in this case, there's no need to. There's no need to make it more complicated than it already is. Uh, it as as a small note, it's been recommended that you mute the window sound. I don't know. I don't know if it's easy to do at this stage, but apparently yeah, I, don't, I know we uh, might have to wait that until till next time. We'll, I'm we'll sorry. Put some plays. That's why I brought it up. Cause I was, I knew it was one of those things that I was, I don't really, yeah. I don't know how to turn it down without turning you down. I'm sure it's not that hard. I just don't know how to do it right now. Yeah, it, it's fair. I'm going to um, do my best to type very purposefully so that I don't, uh, cause it happens when I like, I'll like hit mash escape a couple times cause I'm using Vim to break out of input mode and windows will complain about that. Right. Right. So that I was wondering, cause yeah, cause I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what would be causing that. Um, it's me fat fingering the keyboard <laughs> bling bling. Yeah. I'll, I'll do my best to, this will be a, um, a master class in typing here. <laughs> All right. I also noticed that, you know, there was a mention of why not use get access raw. We could change it later. Right now, we're just trying to keep this as, as simple as possible. Yeah, there's there's a method to the madness with this input. We're not going to use a vector for this for a very particular reason we'll get to later. So if you drop this on now, theoretically, we should be able to put these scripts in the scene and test them. You might have to move out your mono behavior to a separate class. Yes, I will. That's a little gotcha with... <clears throat> Unity, by the way, your mono behaviors have to live in their own class file or else they will not be seen by Unity. Mm -hmm. All right, let's add a cube in here. Cube. 
beautiful. And then we're going to add our character mover. No, you're going to add a character. Mover is going to be oh, our right. helper I'm function. Uh, character. Which, uh, did I make it a mono behavior? Uh, we didn't, I think. I thought I did. Maybe, oh, it's not. Live, it has to go to its own class file as well. Right, right there you go. <clears throat> I just said that, and then I didn't do it. How <laughs> <laughs> you like that? All right, there's a character, right? Oh. A, cube is a character, and then we're going to add another uh, game object, which will be our character mover, not to be confused with character controller. Naming things is hard, everybody. It sure is. Char character mover. All right, boom. Yeah. All right. And then and drag the character in. Yeah. yeah. Get the idea. Oh, shoot. Let me move the inspector over here. I I, I know that this was an issue last time. I keep our, our faces on top of the... um on the right side of the screen, so you don't always see. <laughs> so as you can see here on, on the left, this is the hierarchy. We've got a character, and it has our character script that we just created, and then the character mover is here, and it's referencing our character in the hierarchy. So we'll go ahead and press play. I'll probably have to move the camera. Yes, I will. Let me move the camera right here. Here's a little hot uh, Unity tip. Control Shift F. F, yeah. yeah. It's gonna move. It's probably one of my most used Unity shortcuts. Yeah, that's gonna position uh, any object that I have uh, in focus exactly where my view is. So I just move. Well, keep in mind, you probably want to focus it so that the forward blue arrow <clears throat> yeah. is represents the forward axis. Otherwise, it'll be visually confusing. That's a good point. What's it like this? Well, click on the, the cube, figure out where forward is for it. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah. I figured it was uh, in global space, but it's good. Yeah. All right. Control Shift F. Boom. Now the camera is pointing where we our view was. We'll hit play. Mm -hmm. God willing, let's see. Oh, oh, arrow keys. <laughs> so now every time I hit the up key, it moves up by uh, one yeah. world space down. You get the idea. Yeah. So this is a character. Now here's where here's where things get interesting because right now you could have done this without interfaces. This is just move a thing with with some up down left right function. But this is where I want to take a bit of a pause and talk about before where I said the difference between an abstract class and an interface. An interface promises the ability to conform to a contract, not telling you what it does. So in this context, if I said, I have a cube and it's movable, you will immediately think, oh yeah, forward, back, left, right, it can move, I get it. But what if I was to say that a, uh, an audio source could be movable? Now, naming might not be great. We might want to change it to navigatable or something. But functionally, if you think about it, I could take a audio source and I would be able to move it by uh, pressing back and forward, kind of like a music player, and then up and down would control the volume. That would fundamentally conform to that same uh, contract without being a movable object in the physical scene. So that's a way of keeping the same interface, but for different things. So even though we're probably not going to play audio, I think it might be a good quick one to show. What do you think? Yeah, sure. So let's just do a, we'll call it media player. because I think that might be a good example of a completely separate type of object. Yeah, and we're going to say this is movable. And in this, in this context, we're saying can move, as in can move through the menu of it or can move through the song list. That's conceptually what we mean. Right. So if you do an awake function and grab the audio source. I'm being very, I'm, I'm going very slow so I don't make any windows bings <laughs> uh, to put that into a private member variable, right? Just mm -hmm. audio. Oh, yeah. No, no, we, we just need uh, one audio, audio source, source uh, okay. and then a list of audio clips Yeah. or an array, whichever. Okay, so we'll get our, our audio source. Mm -hmm. This is hard. This is nerve wracking. <laughs> Good component. Like you're defusing a bomb or something. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, and then a list of audio clips, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what Lorenzo says is usually my best, my, my implementation is I won't bother making interfaces unless uh, things are actually used. And if things are going to be used, then it create interface. We're just doing it in kind of reverse order here because we're demonstrating the use case for it. You, you can get clips off of this, right? Uh, well, How is it? You're going to pass them in? 
No, no, you, the clips are the array of clips. And what we're going to do is we're going to make an index and iterate through the array and then hand the clip to the audio source. I knew that. Relative I was just testing this. you. <laughs> I don't work. Can you tell that I don't work with audio very much? <laughs> yeah, not me neither. Well, I, I guess to be fair, I do a lot of uh, audio generated code stuff because I like, yeah, I like all of that fancy stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, so right. we can just say in uh, for simplicity, we'll say up is going to be easy. That's just going to volume. be uh, audio source dot volume plus equals volume step. We'll just yeah, create right. a field for volume step. Uh, make it a serialized field. Sure. Set what step? <laughs> All right. Can I don't look at the chat? They're pointing out how many people are watching you type right now. Don't, oh god, don't no! no. <laughs> well, all you people, hit that, smash that like button. <laughs> if you're gonna point out all the people watching, I'm gonna make you hit the like button. <laughs> uh, do a float. Do a float because it's gonna be an increment between zero and one. So you're gonna want to have like uh, point two as your audio step. Yeah, zero point two f or something. I can do a. I can do a fancy. Range. Ooh, go fancy, yeah. You like them apples. Yeah. All right. And then, and then down further. will be, you know. We'll probably have to hold keep an index for the uh We left will indeed, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But got a, that was simple enough. So now we'll just have an index for the the current, current clip. Clip. I get super verbose. This is, this is my Java experience. Index of current Ugh. clip. Nah, Yuck. Nah, 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 nah. Yuck. Hey, I, 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 feel, I feel you. Current clip. <laughs> so the way I like to do this is just in left and right, just increment or decrement the clip and then have a function called update current directly afterwards. That way I don't have to deal with conditional logic in, in this place. I can do it in one place. I like so. Yeah. Update current clip. Yeah. Come yeah. on. How are we going to know? The current what? No, that's, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Uh, come on, go down. No. All right. So this will be uh, audio. So uh, do so. First of all, do current clip equals mathf dot clamp between zero and uh, clip stop length minus one. So above forty two. What? 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 Sorry, forty two. Yeah. Above that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna clamp that current clip index to between zero and max on the list. Is it? Wh clamp. Is it's mathf dot clamp. With? Right, right, yeah, right there, yeah, math right, clamp. Right, right. And you want to go zero. Uh, oh, sorry, it's current it's value first. So it's underscore current clip, comma, zero, comma. Gotcha. And then instead of max, that's going to be uh, clips dot length minus one. Uh, 42, the, the very end, instead of max. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, my brain. I, ju I did look at the number. I just want to let you all know that. That's why I'm... <laughs> Uh, audio, uh, audio clips. Audio clips. I think it's audio clips. Yeah, I forgot we called it. <laughs> Count minus one. All right. Yeah. Oof, pretty. Good. I can't. I can't remember if clamp is exclusive upper bounds or not. Just hover over clamp, just for my own sanity. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's not. Okay, that's it's good. between the range. Yeah. yeah cool. Okay. So now you need to assign it. So underscore current clip equals that. Uh, the audio audio clips index at current i'm glad you're driving no no, no. Oh. above up no no 40 43 no. Oh, underscore agree. current clip equals because that clamp is returning the value no see i that's why i should have called it index of current clip <laughs> yeah, and now, now you can assign it so you can just say audio source dot clip equals audio clips <laughs> We made and it, by the guys. way, everybody, don't, don't judge too harshly. If you've ever had to try and code live while someone's watching you, this is Thank very you. stressful. I appreciate I've that. done, um, if you've ever done pair programming, it's usually one person watching, one person driving. And the benefit of it is the fact that you can um, have people, uh, basically you can turn off a portion of your brain and focus on the typing while one person focuses on driving. And oftentimes you'll switch places and it makes things a lot sort of easier to deal with. Yeah. My brain is. Uh, as for off. Tron's suggestion, yes, you could use that operator, but the problem is that's only going to work in terms of upper bounds limiting. But we're using an update current clip that also needs lower bounds limiting. So if we did that, we'd still get in the negative numbers on indexes. So rather than use a modulus, I'm just going to have a straightforward clamp. All right. So and then yeah, I guess I can't remember if it automatically plays when you change it. So I so just on the next line, just for oh, after 44, just do audio source play. 
Now, I don't think we should bother actually playing it. I'll just have to say, trust us. But we've basically implemented a uh, media player that now conforms to the I can move. Would it show the current clip of the audio source? Uh, I, don't have, I don't even have a bunch of clips, so. It would if we had audio <laughs> clips in it, but we don't. I don't so. have any clips. So anyway, no, but this is a good, yeah, I, a good example yeah. of how the, the, the move, I can move, you, it, movement has changed now from physical spatial yeah. movement to now we're moving and navigating, as you said, mm -hmm. it might, might be called I navigatable in a real production situation. Yeah. But, we, uh, we kind of keep this simple, but so here's the idea. And to answer the question of why don't I use just I can move? Well, here's the thing. I could now have an array of game objects and I can say for each one of these, get the ones that are movable, move left or right. All of a sudden that same array can control everything from audio changes to positional movements of objects without having to really know what that implementation detail looks like. Hmm. So, um, yeah, we could keep going with this. Like we could do stuff like, we could have a color that changes between random colors on left and right, and maybe up and down will like change the brightness. Light is another easy one. You can have lights. Oh, let's, yeah. actually, let's do a light. That's a real quick let's one. Let's do a light. So uh, just just to uh, mention, we got about 30 minutes left. So um, yeah, drop, so maybe drop we'll your keep questions it simple, in. We'll keep yeah. it simple. Drop your questions. And yeah. uh, I think we wanted to gauge to see how this went. So the next stream, we might iterate a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a hard time trying to, Oh yeah, I think apparently we're missing. Oh yeah, we're missing update current clip on right. I think. Go down. Oh yeah, yeah right. we sure are. Um, let me copy that. Good catch. Um. So yeah. So either way, that that functionally works. And then the next one is uh, we'll just do a light. All right. What do you want to call this? Just I I call it smart light because it's a light that's controllable like a real smart light. That's what I usually do. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Smart light. Yep. And this. for this one, I tend to just call in the awake get component light and I just work with that. Oh, I think I found my groove here. Uh, there's an interesting comment here. Uh, creator of Zenjack called creating interfaces for every class regardless of said interfaces, having multiple implementations, an anti-pattern. So mm. stating the public method properties and events of the class already do comprise an interface contract. Uh, I'm not sure what to think of that. Well, I'd actually agree. And mostly because, I think I've discussed this before, but it's aside from the semantic difference between an abstract class representing a base set of behaviors and an interface representing a contract of a particular behavior, um, more so than that, the interesting thing about the abstract class versus interface sort of dynamic is they are basically the same thing. And I've mentioned before, the only reason they exist as two separate things is to deal with something called the diamond problem. And it's effectively down to the, the idea that if two, two abstract classes extend from a similar base and then it mm. trickles down and something ends up with two abstract base classes with the same function names, you don't mm. know which one to call. And uh, that's down to the compiler is confused and doesn't know how to deal with that problem. Yeah. And so some languages have multiple inheritance with implementations, other ones do not. So for all intents and purposes, in terms of how they function, they're both the same thing. So if you've got an abstract uh, contract, it is a contract. It doesn't matter how many implementations you have. The only reason you'd really use interfaces like this is where you have multiple things implement the same kind of behavior. Or uh, another interesting reason is when you get into testing, what you can do is sometimes you'll add an interface to a behavior that doesn't have multiple implementations exclusively because if you use the interface implementation, you can then build a test around that object and pass in a substitute for the real one. So for example, if I'm building a system which uh, contacts a web API and gets me back a list of Pokemon, then I could, every single time I want to test that class, call get Pokemon and get the list, but the problem is I'm hitting that database every single time. If I instead, even though there's only one implementation, the thing that goes to the API, create an interface for it, I can pass in a fake one and I can say, whenever I say get all, return this in memory list of three items, I can test whether the rest of the code works against that interface implementation without having to actually hit the database. And I can still test the rest of my code functions. So in the case where you're doing testing, it might still be good to have a interface implementation for one entity. But other than that, 
I do agree. There's no point in, in having interfaces for no reason. And a lot of people, when they first start using interfaces, they get into that bad habit of um, putting interfaces on everything. And it's, it's worth noticing if you're not getting value from an interface, there's no point in adding it. And so ask yourself what value that interface is adding for you. I'm getting cute with this, by the way, as you talk. Oh, that's fine. Well, I was going off that route. I've not been paying attention. So. No, that's cool. <laughs> I, I basically, I, would, I was using up and down as an intensity step, and I was going yeah. to use left and right to lerp between two colors. Oh, cool. Well, well I, I used left and right before for the scale, but yours is probably more interesting. Than <laughs> yours, so. Yeah, I was hoping maybe it would look cool. I, I'm sure I butchered all this code, so you'll have to tell me. But um, <laughs> uh, why is this? All right. So I'm going to do light dot color. Wait. Oh, light is actually a... Yeah, but that's that's a get component yeah. one, the classic get component. I can't component believe they even used to they used to have yeah. that. <laughs> yes, uh I was gonna do color dot lerp and then we had color one, color two, and mm -hmm. then have the color range. And I was trying to clamp between zero and one, and left would be color range minus minus. Oops. Oh, I see so you're actually gonna do it in steps. Cool. Yeah. I thought you were just gonna jump between two, but that's 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 more interesting. So then we have left and right is this color lerp. And then up and down is just the intensity of the light. So uh, I would I would give a color range step size because if you're moving by just ones, you're going to jump quite heavily to zero to one. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely right. All right. Uh, maybe I'll just do it by point two. Just no, 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 it's fine. Just, yeah, yeah, it's going to say point two. I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll hard code it. Yeah. Uh, minus equal zero point two f. This one we can actually demonstrate too. Um, Let's um let's oh, actually yeah. do an array of game objects, get these and do it on all of them. That way we can do a quick oh, I test, like that. I think. Okay, so if you want, you can also grab the the the, the here's one we created earlier rather than rewriting from scratch the uh the getter for the input one. It's up to you. Which one? In the in the other project, remember I had the um the the generic function that would do this? It's up oh, to you whether you want to do yeah, that rather yeah. than having to write the no, switch. I don't want to I don't want to oh. write that again. <laughs> Let me pull that up. Let's see how hard that's going to be to grab and copy and paste. Yeah, there'll be a little bit of deleting for some of the. But if you just grab the, even if you just grab the generic function and the move function, that should be enough. I've also got an enum in there called uh, directions, so that might help. We'll As you can see, we didn't super prepare this. We're kind of making this <laughs> off the cuff. We had a few discussions about where to go with it, but we haven't got a lot of prepared code. So can I just? We hope it makes drag sense. Drag these into the project. Yeah, you can. Okay. You'll have to rewrite it because I, I I named it a different function uh, interface name, but other than that, it's the same kind of thing. All right. And uh, you you have the cardinal sin of just calling it up down left right when I personally call it move up down left right. So you might have to uh, correct it for that as well. I'm gonna get rid I know, of actually, all no, this. I didn't. I, I made a mistake. There you go. So yeah, instead of I am navigatable, that's what I called it, navigatable. But it's the I same idea. Move. Yeah. And all you right. can delete the other the color and percentage stuff. That was the other example we were gonna do. All right. Um, you can delete uh, those. Yeah. That's validate function. We're not going to use that. And uh, same for input. We're... Yeah, you have to copy your input stuff into this though, because I was using an input provider. So you know you're up, down, left, right. Yeah. So basically, all I need to call it just up. Yeah. You just paste in those other ones from the other example. Grab this over here. Uh, where was it? Char uh, what did I call this thing? Character mover. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to grab all that. Give me this. There you go. Yank that. Yeah, so don't focus too much on the code, everybody. We're we're just plumbing a few things. This is supposed to be an example. <laughs> oh, you're gonna need you're gonna need a lot of that. Am I? Yeah. The only bit it, update movement's gonna be the same. You're just gonna be changing the uh, line, the, the red. I was portion. just gonna I was just gonna copy my, my all my update stuff because this. You're stuff... gonna have to rewrite all of the direction stuff. Though. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um. So what am I copying from here? Here, guys. Well, just pa bit. paste in just the the input for literally the in input functions, the mouse button and the. Okay, I think I copied too much. Let me go back to my character mover. I'm just grabbing. So yeah, literally from yeah. from 27 down to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I grabbed yeah. my uh, my update method. Yeah. Now you can literally just replace those with press left, right, up and down. That's it. All right. Press. It's not easier. Yeah. Well. Let's press right. All right. Press right. Uh, down. I feel like we should give a quick skim of what the code does afterwards before we run it, but it, I don't want to focus on it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you can get rid of color and percent as well. We're not going to use those. So effectively, this updates the movement. And how does it do it? Well, it checks the up. So if you pressed up, it does a move up. If you press left, move left, and so on. And it's done in this update movement function here. 
So it just updates all of the things that conform to the I can move interface by calling the appropriate step based on the direction. So that's all it does. You can ignore how it does it. I, I don't get into the details. That's not relevant. The point of this demonstration is to show how an interface can be applied in multiple cases. So it effectively translates up, down, left, right in terms of arrow keys into up, down, left, right directions and calls that appropriate function on the interface. So let's head back over to the Unity editor and um, hope we didn't break anything. <laughs> Let me add a bunch of lights, a bunch of point lights. Yeah. And uh, add my smart light. Mm -hmm. All right, so there we've got that. We'll see the intensity, intensity step will be 0.2, I guess. Color one here is going to be red, then we'll do... Don't forget, blue. you need to put an alpha for that. I, that's one thing I wish Unity would fix. What's that? No, like in the colors. Look at the black bar underneath it. Oh, wow, well, that's annoying. They're, they're invisible. Yeah, they default all colors to being zero alpha because that's obviously what I want with every color on the sign. <laughs> so if anyone um, from Unity ever watches this, please default the bloody alpha to the full value for every single color. I'll duplicate these. Let me turn on my gizmos so we can see where these lights are. The gizmos will change color too, which is nice. And yeah, and uh, I'd recommend just for the hierarchy, remember to make put that script we wrote into the scene and put these as children of it. Okay. So we're going to grab, uh, oh, I already have it in the scene. It's the character mover, no? Uh, I don't think so. That was an old script. We're, it's a new one now. What did I call that thing? Example controller. Got it. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. All right, so we'll say example controller. Yeah. And then these and guys. Drag all your lights in. And drag the character too. Well, the character conforms it too. You might as well drag true, him in. True, true. And get rid of the character mover for now, yeah, to avoid confusion. So that right. should be okay. It's not the most verbose example, but we'll, we'll see how it. Let's see, you working here? Oh, yeah. There we go. So it's a, it's a bit silly, but the point is, these are two vastly different conceptual concepts moving a cube and also moving between two color ranges and moving the intensity of a light. They both conform to a, I can move, and they are basically doing different things with that contract. And this is really the thing I want to get across because I've seen this kind of confuse the most um, in the comments. An interface is not meant to encapsulate the entire set of behaviors of an object. Having a controller, having a character, and then an I character doesn't really give you anything. Having an NPC and an I NPC doesn't really give you anything. But having a I can move, I can die, I can change color lets you have multiple things that could conceivably be impacted by a single script. You can have one script that says interpolate between two colors, and you could pass in anything which promises to be colorable. And that's the point of having interfaces. You encapsulate a behavior that multiple things can use. As an example I used before was water. You might have a container. That is, I can fill with liquid, and you can pass water into it in an amount. And you might initially start with thinking, I'll have a bucket, or I'll have a cup, or I'll have a glass. And these things are all able to contain water. But you might end up having rain in your game, and rain is filling up the cups because of the water hitting it. But what if you wanted to have a, um, a person's clothes get wet by being in the rain? You can have, I can contain water on a jacket. You may not have originally conceived of that as an idea, mm -hmm. but as you now walk around the game world, that jacket could be receiving water from the rain and get heavier, and maybe that affects gameplay. So an interface isn't meant to encapsulate an entire set of behaviors. It's meant to say, here is a little pocket of behavior that lots of things could conceivably all agree to do, and you can impact them kind of en masse, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I think uh, the light example was kind of a neat one. I like that. Let me change some colors here. Some yellow and purple. This is the part of the stream where I get really excited about what we made and I play around with it for way too yeah. long. <laughs> and it's also the crazy stuff we could do with interpolation and, and changing, you know, all sorts of other values. Yeah. Uh, and w without going too far into this, we could even do a command pattern and make a remote control, which could conceivably, you could point at different items and it would perform the actions. So imagine mm. having a remote control with four buttons up, down, left, right. You'd be able to point at a light and then change its values, point at the cube and change its values point at a menu and move up and down, and it would all be conceivably using the same interface yeah. of being able to move regardless of what the object is. And uh, yeah, so I hope that at least gives a good example of what the general point of an interface is. 
And if you combine them together, you can start to get more robust behaviors. Yeah. So this this is hopefully a more visual one than more than the practical examples you'd want. But in a real scenario, imagine this was take damage and die and other things that game objects could do or is visible and things can turn on or off visibly. And you could have everything in your scene, everything from UI elements to game objects to article systems all know how to visibly change and have the same interface. You could iterate every single one of them and hide them all or show them all. Or, you know, the, we, we talked about the, the damage thing. You could have something receive damage and it could be a player who loses health. It could be a, uh, a crate that like, you know, starts to get cracked and damaged. Um, it could be a cloud of gas where every time it receives damage, it gets weaker or thinner. It doesn't matter what it is conceivably, as long as it conforms to the contract of when I receive a damage number, I know how to visibly affect myself based on that damage number. Yeah. And, and something that just comes to mind is that really the value that we're getting here is in that this is, this is a collaborator. Other classes need to collaborate with um, objects that inherit from this interface. And I think that's probably a good rule of thumb, a, a rule of thumb to think about when you're contemplating whether or not you should pull some, um, pull some logic up into an interface or pull some contract up into an interface. Like for instance, how we didn't need to take this um, movement logic, the fact that I'm pressing keys, we decided not to pull that up into its own interface because at this point in time, we don't really need some sort of collaborator that we can swap out with something else. Right now, it's all just gonna be baked into, for example, our example controller. Mm -hmm. But um, in the future, we might think, hey, look, not only do I want to use this movement elsewhere, or maybe I need to um, be able to switch between different types of movement. In that case, I'm going to need some sort of a swappable collaborator. That's when you can, you know, pull out the contract and, and have implementations of it. And there's this this stuff kind of uh, goes very deep. We haven't really gotten to some of the more advanced patterns. Like, without getting too crazy about it, I don't, I don't want to demonstrate it, but just as an idea, we're making our own entities, so we're able to conform to our own interfaces. So we're able to make things that follow those interfaces. But if you've got someone else's system, say you've downloaded a character controller from someone else's game, or you're using a tweening library or a particle system, you can use what's called the adapter pattern. And you could basically make something which knows how to take in this third party item, conforms to our interface, and then calls methods on that other item based on our interface. Now, technically, our light, our smart light, is already an adapter pattern, but I don't want to go too far to that. All I'm saying is, once you have this sort of construct of, of how things talk to other things, you can scale this infinitely by using the contract to your advantage. Now, we've used in a previous example talking about um, fulfilling orders and uh, deliverer, I think was the example we used, wasn't it, Charles? Deliverer? Yes, the, com yeah. the company and a deliverable and a, yeah. Yeah, so it's the same idea. That's it's a that cool example. We, we, can, we can add new types of deliverer items as we go and if, if new technologies arise in our system or we implement new features, the goal is to maintain that solid principles um, sort of conforming to those rules by being closed for modification and open for extension. And if we make an interface like this, even if we add new entire systems to the game, say you add a spaceship and you want that to fly around, maybe that move will do something different. Or maybe you have a, a, a factory game and move left, right, up and down will actually rotate your building. We can add all those features without rewriting this example controller because the example controller will know how to talk to these new systems without being rewritten because it conforms to this contract from the older systems. So as long as other things can match that interface, we can infinitely scale. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that I think that's pretty good. I think we can. Jason and I will talk about how we can iterate on this. Um, I see a good question, but before we get to that. Um, I think I'm going to try to make this code available on my Patreon page for free, of course. So at some point today, I'll upload that if you want to just play around with it. Um, see if you can't, uh, you know, make your own smart things and, and uh, come up with your own examples of what I can move. But I'll put that out. And then next week, um, we'll go ahead and see if maybe there's some more, something we can iterate on. And maybe to this week's video will probably be something akin to what we've covered today because I think it's a pretty example. Me and Barley will get into it about, <laughs> <laughs> about interfaces possibly. Um, but okay, so I see a question. What do you think about nesting interfaces? I think they're fine, but I do think it's one of those things where you need to know what you're doing. Yeah. So if you think about it, an interface encapsulates one single behavior. 
you might have an interface that says can move. You could have another interface that says can receive items, and another interface that is can have a conversation or, or can, can dialogue or something. Hmm. These are three separate behaviors, but usually you would use all three in an NPC. All NPCs conceptually in a certain game might have inventories of stuff that they could give or take, be able to move around, and be able to talk to the player. Hmm. So you might take all three of those and create a I'm an NPC interface. And that way, anything could choose to be an NPC and have to conform to every step of that to be able to be one. So sometimes it makes sense if you're trying to group together behaviors, because you get into that problem that we talked about earlier, which is if you downcast a NPC to an I can move, mm -hmm. you have no idea if they can receive items or if they can do dialogue and you end up doing some really hacky stuff, like taking an I can move trying to cast it to an I have inventory and then checking <laughs> if the inventory exists. And that's really, really bad practice for a whole number of reasons. Yeah. So you're better off if you know for a fact there's a lot of common use cases where you need the behaviors of all three of these interfaces, but you don't want to pass around the concrete type. You take all three interfaces, take another interface that they all match from, and then use that one. And a good example of this is C Sharp does it itself. You are using I list whenever you are doing for loops or for each loops or whatever, um, all list types, any, any element that's a collection that uses uh, an index, so that's arrays and lists, they all conform to the I list contract. Well, actually, it doesn't, it doesn't have it. Never mind. But either way, <laughs> there are various items that conform to I list. But if you look at what I list is, an I list is actually an enumerable, a collection, yeah. a read only collection, because rather than having to implement every single one of these each time, it's conceptually understandable that a list is a thing that can be enumerated and has indexes and is read-only and has these other behaviors. Now, other things might be enumerable, for example, like a coroutine, but a coroutine is not a list. So you might want that individual behavior, but you might also want the collection behavior for certain things. Hmm. So there's no downside to having a kind of inherited nested interfaces, providing they add value. And that's the number one thing I'll say. This, this can look like a magic patch all where it just feels very technical and cool. So you'll just add interfaces to everything. But if it's not adding value to you, do not add it. In this example, yeah. it's literally giving us the freedom to have multiple sets of things all be movable. If it wasn't doing that, we wouldn't be using it. So don't use it randomly, but it, it isn't a bad thing to do. Yeah, it, again, it's just one of those things like every time you, you learn a new design pattern or you learn new, some new construct of how a language works. I mean, realistically, you're just arming yourself with tools so that yeah. when, you know, when you come across a situation where you need different things to have the concept of movability, you know, then you can need to you downgrade that to an interface. But, you know, don't don't go turning everything into an interface. That's probably yeah. where the creator of Zenject, um, Steve, you know, has that sentiment about you know, turning everything into an interface is an anti-pattern because I'm sure there are plenty of... It, it is a bad habit. Like as someone who's habit, tutored yeah. a lot, people will do this. As yeah. soon as you start teaching them about interfaces, they know they're valuable and they know they represent a contract, but they start doing I character or I dog or I player. <laughs> and it's like, these don't add anything to you. If you had an I movable, um, I can collect items and a player extends both of those, sure. But having an I player doesn't give you anything unless you're literally writing unit tests for a player and need an abstract version. And even then that's probably unlikely. Yeah. So just don't throw interfaces at a problem. <laughs> Ask yourself if it's actually adding value. And to be honest, we hope to get to the point where we can explain when it does add value by doing more of these videos once we start getting deeper into design patterns. But honestly, design patterns are a really big topic and they're all underpinned by the basic understanding of what abstraction is. So until we kind of feel like we've covered this general idea of interfaces and abstract classes well enough, we're not going to dive into the real meat of all of this where you'll see some real value, which is design patterns, until we got this down. And honestly, I think we're still a good bit away from covering enough about interfaces. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think this was pretty good. Um, again, I'll put this code up onto Patreon and... Uh, Keep an eye out for in the coming days. I'm going to be trying to put a, cl a live stream clip out every day. So if you see that roll through on your feed, be sure to check it out. Give it a like and a comment. You know, the, all the YouTube algorithm type things. Uh, also hit a like on this video. And uh, if you haven't had a chance, check out the video I posted up yesterday. Um, it's just another installment of my monthly asset, productivity asset um, recommendation. Um, it's a pretty cool one in there. Give it a shot. 
And uh, otherwise, stay safe out there. If y'all are working from home, you know, keep stay focused. We talked about this earlier in the stream. Uh, treat it like your job. Don't treat it like your home and you get to do some work on the side. And um, yeah, man, just be safe. Self-isolate. And uh, <laughs> drink plenty of fluids. <laughs> that that one, yes, 100%. Drink lots of water. And beer is not a fluid. Water. <laughs> Although you can drink beer. <laughs> All right, guys. What, what about whiskey? Does that count? That you can drink. Yeah, I'm sure there's Good, some. I keep that here for emergencies as well. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> if it all goes to shit, we know you'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, everyone. Take care. See you next time. Good luck, everybody. End stream. Do I want.